Welcome back to Got Tech the Podcast, episode 3 entitled The Porcelain Goddess. Today we are going to go over ways to find your place of creativity. We're going to answer the question of the day, which is how to enhance discussion-based lessons in your classroom. We're going to go over some creative ways to use Google Sites for your classroom activities. And then Nick and I are going to go at it at our third battle royale. We're evened up at one to one. I'm going to win this week. Check us out. Here we go. To start off today's episode, we're going to focus on creativity as we ask the question, where do you work that inspires the most productivity and the most creativity when it comes to uh, lesson ideas, lesson creation, and just generally thinking of new things? Um, I know everybody kind of has their own sort of special rituals and locations where they think they get the most out of that time or where you come up with your best ideas. So we just kind of want to get the ball rolling and throw out some experiences we've had with this. And I know, guys, you and I have talked about this a fair bit. We both have some pretty weird spots where we go to do our best work absolutely absolutely so uh when i was first starting off teaching i i'm a nature guy i like to be out on the trails i like to be uh hiking camping fishing kayaking all that good stuff so i used to grade my papers by uh climbing to a top of this uh tree that overlooks a creek or a stream and uh, a lot of times i would be visited by deer and a lot of nature and wildlife, but I would I would strap myself into the top, kind of like a hunter would do on his tree stand, and uh, I would grab all my papers that I need to grade, and I would start grading, you know, while watching wildlife come up to the stream and just have a good time up there. How did you how did you keep the papers from flying around all over the place? I've always wondered that. So I used a clipboard. I had a backpack. I would go up. I would have them clipped in. I'd have them strategically placed in folders in my backpack, and you know. Typically, I would just hang the backpack on on the side of a branch, Mm. on the side of the tree, or do something like that and have it there. And I'd grade four or five, and then I'd transfer them into a folder and grab another four or five and just keep doing it. I could have a whole class is done in, you know, probably half the amount of time if I would do it at, at work, just because you're always being interrupted at work. Whether you're on hall duty or during your prep period, you get people to come in and talk to you and... You and I can get distracted just by having each other next sure. to each other. So see, I couldn't do that one because I just want to be looking around at everything. Just personally, I, every bird that flew by or every animal that walked past, I'd stop and I'd have to watch them, and I probably wouldn't get anything done. Uh, I don't know. Like I need some type of a distraction. Yeah. During the uh, the winter time when football's on on Sunday, I would have uh, two three games going on. <laughs> On the big screen, I'd have it split screened. I I might even bring down a second TV, and they would be there. And the only time I would really look up if if there was a big play or something. Right. So that's like a that's a location kind of a thing. For me, it's more about time of day. And I just as I've gotten older and I've been doing this for more and more years, I kind of realize that I I do my best work in the morning. I don't know what it is. Even if I'm super tired and I don't feel like working, that is when I don't know. That's when I seem to accomplish the most. So my favorite time of day is when I get to school early before anybody else, and I think you're kind of this way too. Nobody else is here, so nobody can start talking to you, no students yet, and I just sit and I I process the whole day in front of me. Usually usually that's not grading. Usually that's when I get like kind of ideas, get inspired by something I want to try today that I didn't plan for, but all of a sudden just kind of sitting there in the morning, I'm like, ah, great, now I got to, you know, incorporate this new idea for the day, but that's one of my favorite times to work. Yeah, before the mad rush, just getting that last ditch uh, idea in your head. I get it. Uh, The morning is also great for me. You know, I have two young kids. You know, we have so many activities planned throughout the day. When I wake up, I'm typically the first one up, unless one of the kids are up for some random reason. And I like to go into the bathroom. I get some of the best ideas in the bathroom on the porcelain goddess. You want to know where our episode title came from right there it is and and you know sometimes on the porcelain goddess i get the best ideas and it's just because it's silent yep for me it's the the, it's the shower also kind of strange but when i'm showering in the morning just kind of standing there just you know let the water hit the back of your head sort of zoning out i get all kinds of crazy ideas for the day and usually that leads to me showing up here and then trying to uh, scramble and incorporate whatever thing i thought of actually my whole first year teaching that's pretty much how i did it i would just 
wake up in the morning and standing in the shower hope hoping that I would come up with some uh, cool idea for the day. And nine times out of ten, that's that's typically where it happened. So what is the point of finding that place or that space where you're most clever, uh, where you come up with the greatest ideas or when you get stuff done, you're more efficient? Well, teachers, we all say that there's not enough time in the day, especially in the school day. So sometimes we have to figure out ways to cut corners And a simple way of doing this is just finding and identifying the spaces throughout your day that you know that you're most productive. And I think that's very important. So maybe it only frees up 10, 20 minutes a day, but that will add up over the course of the week. So the lesson here, I guess, is to try and identify next time you go through uh, the next day or your next week of teaching, try and think about what what times of the day are best for you or what locations are best for you and kind of focus on that to get the most out of those uh, spots and times. You're listening to Got Tech, the podcast. You can follow us on our website at www.gottech.com or you can go over to Twitter and follow us at We Got Tech. Nick, over the course of the last week or two, I've met with several teachers that want to start incorporating their projects into an online site, and they always ask me whether I recommend Weebly or or to go to a different type of site, and I always come back and I think, you know, for our needs here at school, we really should just focus on the platforms that we have in front of us, and one of those platforms is Google, um, G Suite, and we have uh, Google Sites new Google Sites is, uh, you know, really taking over. So what I'd like to do is just talk about a couple of different ways in which we incorporate Google Sites into our teaching. Sure. For me, it's working with other teachers to include Google Sites into their teaching. But I've done it in the past. You've done it in the past. We've made a couple together as well. So the first thing that I would like to talk about is claims evidence reasoning. Now, this is a type of activity in which you could do easily and it would be effective without the use of technology. Sure. All right. Should we uh, Should we tell, I don't know if, as the science teachers, we know what that is, but do, does everybody know what that is? I, I think it's starting to make its way so. across, but w- I'll definitely highlight it as I describe the site. And, All right. And something just to remember is we're going to include examples of each one of these in the show notes. Well, most of these in the show notes. So if you want to see an example, uh, you can go check out the show notes and they'll be there. So the first one we're going to talk about is claims evidence reasoning. And the idea behind this is uh, there's going to be a question. For example, can we save the polar bears? Could be my question. And this question is based on a claims evidence reasoning project that has to do with climate change and global warming and you know things of that nature so that was our question can we save the polar bears so what the students would have to do is they would have to come up with a claim which is the answer to the question they would have to find evidence which is going to uh, support or refute their claim and then they have to provide the reasoning behind it by looking at the data analysis from their evidence so that's the general claims evidence reasoning, but how can we use this online? How can we use Google Sites to, to make this come alive a little bit? So for me, what I did is I took a video from the New York Times and I put that on my main page with the question that they have to answer and it kind of gives them a background. Then I would n- make a new uh, sub page or second page that's off of the home page that basically goes over the claims evidence reasoning, what it is and how to find that stuff. Uh, The next thing I would do is I would tell them that they would have to find evidence and I would provide some sites that might help guide them, but they're not restricted to those sites. But if they wanted a place to start, they could go there. And that could be a site that links up to the average temperature per year uh, graphs or the daily temperatures and they could go through and, and kind of pick out what's useful to them. The last portion of the claims evidence reasoning is the reasoning. I would give them some prompts that will help guide them like questions that will help guide them to analyze their data and then what they're going to do is maybe from that they would make a project where they either make a poster the google slideshow a video anything 
maybe it was something on Weave video, and they would make something explaining their claims evidence reasoning. So the first page is the home page introducing it. The second page goes over claims evidence reasoning. And then the uh, third page would be some resources. And then finally, my last page would be a rubric. And rubrics are something that I like as long as they're done in a strong manner. A lot of times, and I was definitely guilty of this early on in my education career, I would just throw out a bunch of stuff that students would have to show me and then I would just put a check mark next to it showing yep. that they had it or I'd write a comment in there showing them that they didn't. But what I was finding is everyone was getting 100. Yep. And this led to grade inflation in the class. So what I did is I decided to move my things that I looked at to check off if they had that. And I made that my three out of five instead of my five out of five. Exactly. And then I, I tried to fill in the four would be going above and beyond and five would be, wow, this is a great project that I want to showcase for the rest of my teaching career. Yep. So that's uh, claims evidence reasoning. So it's it sounds like the, the, the Google Sites application of the CER or claims evidence reasoning thing is really just a vehicle for it rather than just handing out a piece of paper that has like, here's a little spot for you to write your claim. So they, had, they watch a video on the site before they make their claim or just to get them interested in it. And then the evidence page has other resources that they can click on to gather the evidence. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, it's just an organizational vehicle just to drive right. it. But what really makes it come alive is the videos and the resources that right. you put in there. Uh, so I like it. That initial video of the New York Times in there really captures their attention. It gets them to ask questions, which helps drive this whole process. You could, like I said before, you can easily just play the video in front of the whole class and have them do it off of technology. Sure. But I feel like eventually you're going to have them look up evidence anyway on on the Chromebooks that we have or whatever resources that we have. Right. Well, the other thing about, and this is kind of just universal across all the technology that we talk about in these uh, episodes, it may take you some time to put that website together, but how easy is that lesson once you've got that Google Sites created? from year to year, it's just sitting there waiting. All you do is share the link with your class and it runs itself. Absolutely, and the other thing that we have to really uh, think about is we have students that are absent. We have students on college visits. We have students that go on field trips. All these reasons why they're not in class. They're all good reasons. However, there's still an additional thing that teachers need to take care of. We need to get them caught up. But if we share this link out to this website, now we become a 24-hour classroom. They have the ability to email you with questions. They're out a day. Well, maybe they can work on it. Maybe they can look at it on their phone as they're traveling with their parents somewhere. They're on vacation. They're on the plane. You know, they have the internet there. They can look at it. And all the directions are there. They have a way to contact you. So maybe now instead of you have five kids that are absent in the class, now you don't need to explain it to five kids anymore. You could say, hey, did you check out the website? Did you check out what we're working on this week? Yep. Check that out first and then come back and we can discuss anything. That's another time saver too is um, so many teachers complain when the technology stuff comes up because it sounds, and it can be a lot of extra work, but only that initial quantity of work you put in. Once the once that website is created, it's it saves you uh, tons of time. Once you have it, you have it. And I used to do this with my lesson plans too, not to get off topic, but I would do them online. And this was 13 years ago, my first year I did them online. And at the end of every week, I would go back, reflect on the lesson, make changes. And then the next year, all I had to do was add a different date to the top and send it over to the supervisor. So I'll jump in now with something that I've used Google Sites for. Actually, this is something we worked on together last year sort of like a game aspect. You can use Google Sites as a way to host and share out and publicly keep track of classroom games. We did this in the form of um, an amazing race game last year from an AP chemistry class. We set it up where the home page of the Google site was a description of uh, the rules of the game. We outlined all the challenges and the way the teams would compete. There was a link that the students could click on so they could keep track of their scores as they went through the different challenges. If they wanted to know what their uh, cumulative times were and who was in first place versus last place, they could always click there, which is way easier than trying to keep track of it on paper. 
because any changes you made on the Google site, it was just automatically available to everyone. So the way it worked, and you can jump in with this too, because like I said, we kind of created this thing together. Each sub page of the site was a different challenge. So when the kids would come in the room for the day, I would share with them a slip of paper that had a QR code. They would scan the QR code and it would take them to this sub page. And that's how they would find out what their initial challenge for the day was. They would, they would work and compete against one another to complete that challenge. And then when it was done and they could show me that it was done competently, I would give them a second slip of paper with a second QR code that would link to, I think we called that, were those the roadblocks? Yes. That would link to the roadblock subpage where they would find the final challenge of the day and they would all, all race based on time to see who could finish it the fastest. So that was just kind of a creative application of running a game that you could do otherwise in class. I could just hand out slips of paper that listed what all the challenges were, but the fact that they were secret they couldn't see what the challenges were until they got that QR code. The QR code itself was cool. We handed them out special ways. Uh, sometimes I would, I would hide the QR code in different spots around the classroom, and they would have to go find it. It just kind of increased their interest in how the whole thing ran, plus the fact that it's online. So everything is always there for them to see kind of made it a little more, more interesting. And another thing is... It allowed them to get out of the classroom. It got them up, it got them moving. I know a couple of the challenges, they had to come see me in the media center and they had to perform a little skit that was chemistry based or they had to make a poem or they had to draw a picture or there's formulas that they had to solve and they were able to come up see me. I know some went down to the main office to right. see its secretary. So we got other people involved, which was cool. Now, the tough thing with this one for us to post example on this in the show notes is that all the links are hidden because if you didn't hide the links they can just click the next pages uh, on the website right so each qr code is a specific link to a hidden page now what we might be able to do is just uh, make this a pdf and sure you know show just throw those like. in there just so they, they can see what it looks like couple of things. If you're going to use Google Sites, make sure that the titles of your sites aren't concurrent. Make sure that it's not like Site 1, Site 2, or Chemistry 1, Chemistry 2, or anything like that, or Amazing Race 1, Amazing Race 2, because when you go up to the uh, URL address, students will figure out that all they have to do is change yes. the number 1 to a number 2 to get to the next one. And we, we did come across that. Sure. And it's, it's one of those hiccups that you just have to work through. But we identified that they were able to do that. Yep. And we told them not to do it. And they didn't anymore. And then they were able to get through it. And then we went back and we make, made changes to the URLs. But when you change the URL, you're also changing the QR code. So we right. had to... We had to backtrack a little bit. But now that you know that, you'll be a professional at it, and you'll be all good to go there. It, it does point out one of the interesting features that, that Google Sites has, which is being, being able to hide subpages from navigation. With, with the Amazing Race thing, all the students ever saw was the homepage. All the subpages were describing that had the individual challenges, the team challenges. They couldn't see those. The only way they could get there was through the QR code. And it's just a real easy, a couple mouse clicks and you can choose to hide a sub page from people or students being able to navigate there, which is one of the things that makes it so easy. Yeah. Google Sites is amazing in how user friendly it is. It's, it's really a drag and drop type of a platform, which is very nice. All right. Well, I'm going to move on to the digital escape the room. And these are activities that I create using a Google website and using a lot of the G Suite products, forms, sheets, drawings. Drawings has become a new favorite of mine. But a digital escape the room is very similar to an escape the room that is in the middle of the city of Philadelphia. Uh, you go into a room, you have an hour to get out, you solve little mysteries, little puzzles, and it gets you further along in the game until you finally find a key to get out. In a digital escape the room, you're locked within a site and you're working within this site through various puzzles. So what I do is uh, I create a themed site. For example, I just made one on To Kill a Mockingbird. And the whole theme behind it is To Kill a Mockingbird was going to be a banned book for life. It's been banned in certain areas, certain districts, but now 
this was going to be a decision whether or not it was going to be banned permanently from all schools across America. And uh, that was the theme behind it. And what they had to do is basically prove the worth of the book to not be banned and to keep it in educational institutions across the United States. To do that, they had to solve certain puzzles. And some of these puzzles were videos of themes within the book, symbolisms uh, within the book, but we use a lot of the G Suite products, like the Google Form, I uh, make that my lock form. So I say, there's a word lock. So there's a seven letter word that they get from solving a crossword puzzle. So instead of finding like a, a physical key, they have to find a secret word to type into the Google form and that's how they advance through the thing. Right, and you can set the parameters on that Google form. If they're right, it will come up green. If it's uh, incorrect, it will give a message that says incorrect or you're wrong or you can make it whatever you want. You're way off. Right. You know, any, <laughs> any customized uh, message that you want can go there. So I set it up with a word lock there. You could do number locks. You could do directional locks. And what I do is I I create this form that has like, it's my template form. And it has all five or six different types of locks that I use within that Google form. And then they just have to fill in the blank with the correct codes. Cool. So everything in that digital escape the room will come back to that one Google form, which is embedded within the Google site. So the Google site, how does that play into, is that just like they they are on the Google site and that is the the room? Yeah, that, that's the room. And what I'll do is I'll put all the clues uh, on the Google site. They might click a video, watch the video. Right. And at the bottom, I might put in a hyperlink for the for the title of it. They click on the hyperlink and they use information from the video to solve a puzzle or, or Got it. to get information that they'll need to answer or to provide the sure. the answer to the lock in the form. You can get, um, I've seen some of the stuff guys has done with these. It's really cool. And you can get really creative if you start playing around with all the different Google features. One of the best things about Google Sites is if you embed Google Slides, Google Sheets, Google Docs, or what's the image drawing. one? Google Drawing. Everything within those just pops up on the web page itself. As the viewer of the page, you almost don't even know any different. You don't know that there's a Google Drawing there. It just looks like it's an image on the web page. But because it's a Google Drawing, you can make different sections of the drawing clickable. So if there's a clock hanging on the wall, you can make that clock a link where the student hovers their mouse over the clock and clicks it, and it links them to a clue which I think is one of the coolest parts about the, uh, the G Suite features. Right. Some of the different types of puzzles that you can include in there. I use a jigsaw puzzle, uh, which will include the web address for that uh, in the show notes. I use crossword puzzles. I do a red reveal, which is very cool, and I learned that uh, from an online professional development that I, that I took. Is that the Google Sheets thing where it changes color based on what you type in? No, that's a different one. Uh, okay. uh, that's a Google drawing, and it's a red oh. reveal. So you take the red lens and you take it over. Oh, hidden. that's right. There's like a hidden message right, there. Right, right. But you also have the Google Sheets, which you can format each cell. So if you set the formats that if the correct answer is put into that cell, it's going to turn blue. Okay. And that's how I would do a colored directional lock. So I would take a picture of a directional lock and make the north yellow, south orange, uh, east blue and west green and i would ask questions in a google sheet they would give me the correct answer to get the colors which right. will give them the correct combo is it will you be able to like include one of these in the show notes so people could click on one and see what it's like or are they kind of hidden and that wouldn't really be possible uh once again maybe i'm working on a professional development uh for a college course sure and i might have that ready by the time this uh website all right or this uh, podcast is ready to go. So these are just a couple of ways that you can use Google Sites. You could really, I like to say, explore the space because I feel like any type of creativity that you could bring to this, any creative activity that you usually do without technology, you could probably find a way to transform that into a Google Site. Just any, any project. I, I did it this year as an alternative assessment. Rather than have my kids make like a standard poster where they're just drawing stuff, they've done it so many times. They're keeping a, um, 
they have a running Google site. I assigned each student an element uh, off the periodic table, and over the course of the whole year, they keep creating sub-pages, applying what they're learning in class to that element. And it's just sort of like this ongoing large project, and it just gives them another way to show what they know that's not a paper and pencil test, and it works really great, and Google Sites just makes it super easy. So we went over several different ways to use new Google Sites to organize our classroom activities, to get them online, to make them more tech-based, to include like a blended learning type vision to it. And uh, we're going to include all these in the show notes, but what we would really like is if some of you guys reached out and, and also shared some examples of how you incorporated new Google Sites into your lessons. What are ways that you made your projects come alive? You can reach out to us on our Twitter account at We Got Tech, and we'd love to hear what you guys have to say. Hi, my name is Raquel Rivera, and I teach Espanol. I've been wondering how technology might be able to enhance a discussion-based lesson. Thanks, Raquel. That's a that's a great question, and it's a tough one. I think dis- running classroom discussions is one of the hardest things you could do as a teacher because it's it's a lot to keep track of what everyone's saying and make sure everybody has a voice and make sure that every all your students are involved. And I think we've got some good technological tools that can kind of help out help out with that. I know Geis has done a lot with uh, gamification of different things, and I think right. he'll probably start us off talking about that. Yeah, a little bit about gamification. Gamification is basically at its stripped down form making a game out of something that isn't traditionally a game and the way that you would do that is by adding or introducing game mechanics to the activity for example march madness is coming up right around the corner maybe even by the time we produce this show it might be in the thick of it or slightly after but uh if you would take the bracket and you would go fill out that bracket the bracket itself is not a game however if you add points to everyone that you get correct, it becomes more like a game because you're adding some type of a competition there. So game mechanics can include leaderboards, uh, just like I said, getting accumulative points or stars or levels, but all these different factors play in and kind of get kids motivated. Uh, We could do a couple of real life examples. How do major corporations get you to keep coming back for more? Okay. For example, Starbucks. Love Starbucks. They give you stars. You go back Uh, and you accumulate these stars. And then after a little bit of time, uh, you get a free drink because you reach that level of stars that gives you a free drink. You have levels. So I know a lot of schools are going towards badges where you could be, if you do this, you get a level one badge. You get this, you get a level two badge. And when we used to do our using Sophia.org, we used to be able to do professional development on the back half of that tool and get those uh, badges. So that that would be another way. Chipotle did that a few years ago, too, where every burrito you got, they punched a little burrito card. And after like three cards, you got like a hat. And I was obsessed with eating the burritos for weeks because I wanted as many chipotle uh as much chipotle swag as i could possibly get my hands on it was awesome but it really does work it's like a psychological thing your mind just wants as much of that as possible i used to there's a local sub shop right next to uh my high school and every eight subs you got a free sub yep so what i would do is i would stand outside of the uh the hoagie shop or the sub <laughs> shop and i would give people my card hey would you be so uh, kind as to uh, yep. get them to swipe this, and you know, after eight people, I got a free sub. Genius! So I, I know it was the best thing that I did <laughs> until I got caught, and then they uh, they told me to move on from that. Sure. All right. So different ways, different activities that I've used to incorporate gamification in my classrooms is I, I'm I'm very collaborative based, team based learning. I, I love that stuff. As long as you find ways to manage it to make sure that there's um, interest in equal participation. Sure. When I say equal, I don't mean, you know, everyone puts in equal amounts because that's unrealistic. What right. I mean is that everyone's involved in some way, shape, or form. And uh, some of the ways that I've done it, I used to have class survivor. So if I had four classes, 
I would uh, give them all challenges every week that went towards uh, the TV show okay. uh, Survivor. And that was really cool because they got really into it. Uh, the first, you know, couple tasks, if they did the best, they got their flint and their steel to make fire. Right. And they would keep incorporating all these different aspects. But eventually they would have to send someone to Exile Island. Someone that wasn't keeping up with their part got exiled away from, uh, you know, the group. But they could get back in by sure. doing some type of a supplemental activity and so these- get back in. These are all like motivators or like a, a context for students to have the discussions in. Is that kind of where this falls with the whole? Correct. So based on their discussions, they would get points and those points would get them, you know, certain tools that they would need to compete in the game. Okay, cool. So you would do it that way. Another thing that I've done in the past is I've created a thermometer and what I would do is have cells on a Google Sheet kind of border the border of the cells outlined Mm. and as they would uh get points there the cells were um made to change color so the thermometer would read hotter and go up so that that was another way in which uh i kind of introduced gamification to uh enhance a discussion okay nice those are good ideas i I think it's important because discussions are scary to a lot of teachers and uh, the fear is that kids just don't always want to be involved in them. Sometimes it's a little bit of a, a stretch to make it valuable. Uh, so all, these are just some great ideas to kind of help keep things flowing and give students uh, some motivation really to be involved in the discussion. Yeah, another way using uh, Google Sheets again, what you could do is uh, you can break your individual classes into teams and each uh, cell block represents a student and as they give you a quality answer you would give them points kind of like the espn show around the horn i don't know if you watched it but it was four sports analysts and uh you know the host and the host would give points to each of these four analysts as they spoke so basically it's teaching them to have an argument or have a point back it up and uh, not be wishy-washy. And you can make a rubric that you hand out prior to the discussion sure. that identifies how you get one point versus two points versus three points. Maybe a good discussion question that you ask within that discussion that takes the discussion to the next level. Right. That could be rewarded with you know, an extra point. So the five groups in your class... They could see exactly how many points they've earned during that period, and it's updated live because you're doing it on a Google Sheet. That's cool. Makes sense. I've seen, too, um, this is, I think, mostly with a Socratic seminar format of a discussion where the kids kind of sit in a circle. You can designate certain students who aren't part of the circle to, I think it's called discussion mapping, but you pretty much use a, generally with a tablet, so you can draw with your finger and you draw a circle on the tablet and label the name of each student who's in the circle. And as the students uh, make comments or bounce questions off of other students, you draw lines in between them and you get this map and you can see the students that talked the most have the most lines going to and from their name. And that'd be a cool way to tie in with uh, some kind of point system as well. Yeah, that's that's another great one. So I know that uh, you've also been pretty high on a website called Today's Meet. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I'm, I Generally, my teaching style, I like to take almost more of a backseat whenever possible and let the kids run things or, or put the power in their court. And I found a tool called Today's Meet, which is free, which is always awesome, that really allows that to happen. Pretty much Today's Meet, which you can find at todaysmeet.com, by the way. It's just an online chat room service, but it's one that's specifically designed for teachers. So I'm looking at the page right now just to kind of give everybody a sense of what you'll see there. When you go to todaysmeet.com, there's a there's two boxes where you can type things into. It's really simple. One says pick a name, which is the name of your room, your chat room. And then there's another little drop-down menu that lets you choose how long you want to keep it open for, whether it's an hour or a day or a week. And then you just click open and it gives you a little code that you can send out to your students or whoever really, but generally your students that you want to be in the room. And it's just like a little message board and they can type comments to each other. So you can have this going during another lesson where they can post questions or as part of a discussion itself, but in more of a way that doesn't put them on the spot and doesn't put me 
the teacher directly in the driver's seat. Uh, there's some pretty cool tools like a projector view so you can project it up on the screen in a little more of a visually appealing way. It's got a QR code which is probably the easiest way to share it out to your class so they can just scan it and it automatically puts them in the room. There's all sorts of other tools and that's all just with the free version. Now I did just see there's a special teacher tools edition but they charge you it looks like five bucks a month for that and i've not paid it yet so i'm not sure what's in there but it looks like they've got some special kind of classroom management things like passwords and allows you to mute certain students and limit the types of comments they can make maybe to keep it more geared towards certain certain points but uh, i've used it a couple times and it's a really cool helpful way to let technology guide some of your classroom discussions. So I, I guess in closing, we just need to encourage people to find different ways that motivate students, say, in competition. So look at sports and uh, like a certain competitive sport and look at the characteristics that keeps kids involved in that sport and then try to take those characteristics and bring them into your classroom as much as you can. So, uh, Raquel, we thank you for your question. We hope this helps you out a little bit. If you have a question, you can tweet us at we got teched. It's time for the Tech Battle Royale! <laughs> That's right. It's time for our third Tech Battle Royale. Nick, you squeaked it out before. I mean, I'm talking small nose hair type of a win across the finishing line before i got my foot over i don't know about that yeah i mean it was tight last week was a uh, music category and it was a credit box versus his flow vocabulary very similar products uh flow vocabulary allows you to integrate a little bit more i think um, but if you need a quick opening beat or something, you want to get really creative with your students or the students want to get really creative, I think Incredibox is an easy way to go. Well, let's get started with uh, the categories for today so we can tell everybody what I'm going to beat you in again. Oh, those are fighting words right there, <laughs> my friend. So we do. Uh, we have a bunch of categories on our, our wheel of tech. Uh, they are productivity, video and screencasting, learning management systems. We have a bunch of specific course-related categories like STEM, language arts, history, art, and music. We also do uh, browsers and navigation, fun and games, spinner's choice, and then teacher and student favorites. So how about, uh, guys, why don't you spin the wheel? Why am I spinning the wheel? Because I won. And the winner, I don't know if you know about this rule. This is a, a new rule that just happened. But the winner of the previous round gets to pick pretty much everything that happens in this round. So you, you get to make up rules as we go. Well, fine, I'm going to make up a rule too. All right. If I beat you three times in a row or if you beat me three times in a row, I get the pie in the face. And then we'll take a picture of it and put it on Twitter. Can I pick the type of pie? No, because <laughs> I beat you three times. That's right. That's your rule. Fair enough. Whoever wins get to make all the rules. All right. Fair enough. All right. Let's, uh, I'll give this a spin. Very interesting. It looks like our category this week is spinner's choice, which means uh, that's you. You get to pick whatever we argue about today. See, that, that right there is like hitting the jackpot on, the, on like Wheel of Fortune or something. I just got that million-dollar wedge. I think that's kind of showing you how this is going to go so uh all right i'll go i'll pick something i'll make it pretty broad that way uh i know that you're very limited like your vocabulary of apps is very limited so uh <laughs> i'll keep it you know pretty broad for you so you could squeep one in there oh uh, wow thank you thank you so much yeah you're welcome uh all right so let's go with classroom and i'm thinking more on the lines with classroom management and that that's a broad category you could argue something is classroom management that's really not and it sure. will still be okay all right you down with that yeah so uh let's get it started i think um you can start if you want to i, I guess as the winner of the previous round i get to also choose that you get to start off well i this would be the last time that we're tied right now because i haven't started once i start that that's your opportunity all right you still want me to go first? Yeah, let's right. do it. All right. So uh, I guess what I want to talk about is openbadge.me. Okay, we're, we're getting into standards-based grading and uh, having to perform to standards, having to prove that our students 
are coming up to the standards that were set in before them. And some schools are going away from the A, B, C, D, F grades or the pass-fail grades and going towards standards-based grading. So they have to meet standards in one way or another. There's several ways that they could do that. There's several grading systems, but this is just talking about standards. And what a badge system is for a teacher is it allows a teacher to create a visual representation of a standard. For example, you teach chemistry. Uh, maybe one of the standards is how well they handle research. All right? And you wanted to make that a standard based on a certain part of your curriculum. So I can make a badge, a visual representation of that standard. And when students meet that representation or meet those standards, they would get that badge. And this badge can be shown on their social media. This badge can be shown maybe in the classroom if you wanted to print it out and go that way. Uh, but there's many different ways for them to display it. But it is a visual representation that they have accomplished that standard. That's pretty cool. There's a lot of uh, behavioral science in that too, it sounds like, because you're it's more of like a positive reinforcement for doing something good or meeting an achievement or a standard rather than perhaps seeing a bad grade, which kind of stresses kids out and makes them feel crappy if they're not doing what they should be doing in the class. Exactly. It's it's a way to motivate them. A lot of I, I feel like a lot of students would be motivated by that. Right. Did I just help you out in your own argument? You did. <laughs> um, all right. So that's pretty cool. I just, I have to ask the question, though, couldn't I just get a real badge? Like why... Are these like digital badges? Is that how the whole thing works? Yes, it's a digital picture representation. Well, can we just give, like, can I just hand out like little stickers or little, uh, I don't know, like a little policeman's badge or little, like a little sheriff's badge? That'd be way cooler. Well, it's, it's not real. That wouldn't be personalized to the standard. So they want to show that they're very diverse in their knowledge. And if you keep giving them a sticker or a smiley face or a badge, a metallic badge, which costs probably a decent amount of money. Oh, that's true. Money, you know, yeah. I mean, that's coming out of your pocket. Right. This is a something that's created online that you can hand out. All right. Well, I guess, uh, I mean, there you go, people. If you like badges, then uh, you could go for openbadges.me. I got, I got one, too, though, which I think I'm going to go for the simplicity angle in this round just because classroom management is so broad. We could argue so many things. So we'll keep it nice and uh, nice and focused. My resource is a widget built off of teachstarter.com. I'm not arguing for teachstarter.com, just to be clear, but I do want to mention to people that, especially if you're an elementary school teacher, which I am not, but if you are, you should definitely check out teachstarter.com. They have tons and tons of really cool education resources. Uh, almost too many things to mention. I'm just looking at some of them right now. There's topics like literacy, science, social studies, history, geography, and it's just full of all kinds of lesson plans and writing tasks and classroom themes within each of those categories. There's so much cool stuff um, at teachstarter.com. But anyways, uh, what I'm arguing for specifically is one of the widgets from teachstarter.com, which is a random name selector. It's one of my, uh, one of my favorite ones just because of how easy it is to use. Also free, free is always really good. The way it works is you go to the random name generator, you type in a bunch of first names separated by commas. It allows you to select different themes to use. And, and the imagery of it's really cool. It's hard to describe, but there's like a little spinner thing that you could project on a screen in your classroom. And you just click this big red go button and it kind of cycles through the names and it picks a random student name for really anything you might be doing in your class if you need to call on people. So it's random to kind of uh, ensure that you mix up or, or, or change up who you're calling on. So you're not always calling on that same student who you know has the right answer. Makes it seem a little bit makes it seem a little bit more fair to the students. It's just so easy to use and uh you know, every teacher needs a good random name generator. I think this is just the best one. Well, a couple, a couple of things here. We are only going on the random name generator here. We're not judging the site. That, I mean, yeah, that's that is. Correct. I could have just thrown out Google and said, "Game over." <laughs> I mean, so we'll just go with your All random right. name generator. And right. Just to be clear, because I'm pretty familiar with this one. Uh, to be clear, you're entering your class roster, and true, and you're able. The students can actually see all the names go through this little bubble, and then it will randomly pick one. So right. they're kind of held accountable there, and I like that. This is a very simplistic app, and it's a very effective app. But I will say that there's only certain times in which you could use it. It's a very selective tool. 
So if you're doing a that, d- debate true. or discussion or something like that, it's very effective. It's it's very effective. Sure. So where mine is kind of something that motivates throughout the whole unit or throughout the maybe even the whole year. Yeah, but on this one, there's four themes, and one of the themes is called the hero selector, and it puts a little image of like a superhero guy behind the name spinner. That that's phenomenal and that's great, but <laughs> you know what's stopping me from getting a uh, sheet, a king size sheet, cutting it in the four and make capes for everybody and staple their badges on top of it. I guess that could be better. Yeah, I, I I mean, if we're gonna compare oranges to oranges, right? Yours is like a little clementine, and mine's like one of those massa, massa oranges. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I mean, I kind of knew I was a shot in the dark with this one. My uh. My resource is pretty cool, and it works really well, and I do highly recommend it, but uh, I guess stacked up against the the power of assigning badges to students based on things they achieve, it's a tough one to beat. Yeah, I mean, I I I feel like yours is uh, more of a substitution where you could use popsicle sticks. You could just simply call on whoever raises their hand first. It's a very unique way of doing it. I mean, I'd throw on that hero version of it, but... uh, I, I feel like with the badges, it's it's up and coming. We're kind of in the mix of it right now. So are you expecting me to concede right now to this? Uh, I feel I like that's the way it's going. I don't feel like you have to. I think it's already given. All right. You, you can have this one, guys. I can, uh, I can live with that. All right. So that's going to give me some time to uh, gloat a little bit for the next two weeks. I'm definitely going to take his little badge idea and give me a nice shiny star. I'm going to wear that for the next two weeks. Let everyone know that uh, I regained and reclaimed my throne. Live it up, because next week I'm coming back. Well, there you have it. I take down Nick for my second Tech Battle Royale victory. Nick brought us the Random Name Selector tool. It is a very good tool that you can bring into your discussion-based lessons. It is a fair and equitable way to choose students to participate in these discussions. I brought us the open badge tool. The open badge allows teachers to make a digital representation of a student's achievement as a way to motivate and reward students for meeting the standards that they set within their classes. Now, for my victory speech, I'm gonna turn to my wife's cell phone. I found out that she uh, subscribes to a couple of quote and inspirational message apps on her phone. And each morning she gets one of these quotes or motivational messages delivered. And this morning's motivational message was one small positive experience in the morning can change the outcome of your entire day. Now, I'd like to reflect a lot on my teaching practice and my educational experience. And one thing I'm going to do over the next couple of weeks, and I'm going to challenge everybody to do, is to try to locate students and teachers that are coming into the building in the morning. Uh, Maybe they're sleepy, maybe they're just, you know, really stressed out, or maybe they just got done dropping off the kids at daycare and they need a little pick-me-up. So a little random act of kindness or a little compliment to start their day could turn around their day and make it a positive one. So over the next couple of weeks, I'm gonna try to do little random acts of kindness. I'm gonna try to give some compliments that allow students and teachers and anyone else in the building to really start the day right and maybe get more of a positive atmosphere in our school. So I challenge you to do the same. Until next time, you can reach Nick and I on our Twitter page at We Got Teched or on our website where our blog and podcast is located, and that's www.gottech.com. Until next time.